pursue excellence. Nothing else is worth your time. These words were shared with my freshman class on our first day of high school. 20 years later, I find myself repeating them daily. So simple and honest. Yet excellence isn't something that we can easily identify. Sometimes it's intangible. We know it when we see it. But as a result, attaining it can be a mystery. But this isn't the case with all things. In fact, in some things, excellence is crystal clear. And there is nothing more so than what I am most passionate about. Pushing the boundaries of human physiology to run insanely fast. 50 years ago, Bob Hayes ran the 100 meters in 10.06 seconds. That was the fastest any human being had ever run that distance. Today, 1,400 performances are faster, and Usain Bolt would, be, ha would beat Hayes by 20 feet. As amazing as it sounds, though, in 50 years, the tables will be turned on Bolt, and he will be the one that looks slow. And the reason for this is that Anytime we pencil a performance in as the greatest or some, uh, some performer as the pinnacle of human capacity, inevitably someone will come along and show us how foolish we were. But those who are on the leading edge of performance at any moment in time exemplify excellence in a way that is both tangible and in a way we can feel. A show of hands from the audience. How many of you have flipped through the Guinness Book of World Records in an attempt to find an obscure activity <laughs> you could set the world record in? <laughs> I know I have. I also wanted one of these, an Olympic medal. But despite buckets of sweat, I was never better than an average athlete. But I fell in love with what a world record or an Olympic medal stood for. They were excellence, Im excellence personified, tangible, we, we knew there was nothing better. They were to limit the peak of human performance at a moment in time. And this really appealed to me. The other day, I'm playing with my daughter and she challenged me. Dad, let's see how long we can hold our breath. <laughs> how awesome is that? You see, exploring the limits of our human boundaries, of our performance, is one of the most rewarding parts of the human experience. It is quite literally an opportunity to be better than we have ever been before. That is about as close to a definition of personal excellence as you will ever find. But beyond this personal experience, I think we can learn something from those who choose to pursue activities, like sprinting, about the pursuit of excellence. You see, people have been running foot races for millennia, and running is something that is done on every single corner of the globe. Today's tracks are so standardized and the timing systems are so precise that we can measure race results to within one thousandth of a second. Because of this, we know without a shadow of a doubt who is the fastest and how they compare to the millions of people that came before them. For these reasons, we can use something like sprinting at the margins of human capacity as a window, a template, if you will, to what it takes to pursue excellence in a way that is both tangible and clearly defined. And I think this applies whether your goal is to be the world record in the 100 meters or something far more abstract. One of the things you need most is talent. While it's romantic to think that you can be the best through hard work alone, the reality is that this is simply not true. The idea that 10,000 hours of focused work will make you the best person in the world is a myth. 10,000 hours of polishing a turd will just give you a shiny turd. <laughs> Running is a virtual genetics lab because it assesses everyone across the globe in a way that is objective and free of socioeconomic mumbo jumbo. Because of this, we can use it as a template There have been, there have been 10 seconds is the benchmark, the gold standard for elite performance in the 100 meter dash. To date, there have been 676 performances 
that are sub 10 in the 100 meters. This pile of dots you see before you represents those 676 performances with the world record of 9.58 seconds at the top of the pile and all of the just squeaked in 9.99 second performances at the bottom of that pile. I have tiered this graphic so that you can see into tenth of a second tiers with the time on the left hand side and the number of performances in that tier on the right hand side just how, just how much peak performance is really a peak. It is not just a euphemism. When we talk about peak performance, you are quite literally the top of a very elite pile. But we can also look at some other things, specifically talent. The yellow dot you see here represents the lone performance of an athlete of Aboriginal ancestry. And these orange dots represent multiple performances from a single athlete of European ancestry. Every single other dot, every single one, represents an athlete from West African descent. <laughs> every single one. Now, we know that genetics is a common denominator because we're seeing different nationalities, different cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds represented here. So genetics is the common link. Now, if you had aspirations of being the next Usain Bolt and you're not of West African descent, this is pretty discouraging. <laughs> but I would suggest you look at this in two ways. First, you could pursue your goal knowing that you're an underdog. The yellow and orange dots suggest that it is possible, albeit unlikely. There's certainly something admirable and virtuous about being the underdog and pursuing your goals in spite of the odds. Or you can find your gift, your talent, and pursue that. You see, when we look at other objectively measured, widely participated activities, like swimming, like weightlifting, like long distance running, we see the exact same trends, but with people of different ancestry. So while this may not be true, in all activities, say the arts, the humanities, and the sciences, we can still take something of personal relevance from this, from this graphic here. If you want to be the best at something, you need to find your gift and make it your passion. In the early days of amateur athletics, many wanted competitions to be a measure of talent alone. As a result, training and uh, professional coaching was perceived as cheating. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire, Harold Abrams' decision to do both was a scandal. And that's because even then, they knew that talent that was nurtured and developed could easily beat talent alone. And in the case of elite human performance, you can't leave anything to chance. You see, at the elite level, where performers are operating at the fringes of human capacity, there is nothing natural or innate about what they do. These athletes are achieving stride frequencies of five hertz. That's five foot contacts in a single second. They have stride lengths of up to 2.7 meters. With each contact of the ground, they are applying up to five times body weight of force through a single leg and getting on and off the ground in eight one hundredths of a second. They are achieving maximal velocities of 12.8 meters per second. To put that into perspective, that's fast enough in many urban areas to be pulled over for speeding. <laughs> there is nothing natural or innate about that. So while genetics may be the prerequisite for elite performance, it is certainly not enough. Even the very act of running, the motions that all able-bodied human beings are capable of, must be finely tuned so that the athlete can apply the maximal amount of force in the pro appropriate direction in a minimal amount of time. Elite sprint athletes are finely tuned meat machines and it takes a lot of nurture to make that. In 2012, at the United States Olympic Trials, two athletes tied for third place. Normally this wouldn't be a big deal, but in the United States, only three athletes can compete in the Olympics in a given event. That meant that one of these athletes would be going home and not competing at the Olympics. 
The vertical line you see is literally a frame in time from the electronic timing system. It represents one thousandth of a second. And as you can see, these two athletes were indistinguishable. That meant that the opportunity to represent their country in a once in a lifetime opportunity at the Olympics was indeterminable to one thousandth of a second. That's so small that something as trivial as the way you combed your hair might have made a difference. <laughs> Such a case makes you wonder, if anything can make a difference, what matters? The answer is everything. Everything matters. So when I speak of nurture, I'm not just talking about training. I'm also talking about these so-called little things, like sleep, like stress management, like nutrition. If you want to be the best in the world and nurture your talent, you can't leave anything to chance. I like to think of talent and talent development like two flowing rivers. Separately, they can be impressive, but together, they can be unstoppable. And if you want to be the best in the world, you need to nurture your talent. But you need more than just talent and nurturing of that talent. You also need a big stage. And the Olympic year is that big stage. In fact, for 100 meter athletes, or athletes in any Olympic sport for that matter, what we see is that the Olympic year brings out something special. There is expectation, there is pressure. And this pressure and expectation, this big stage with all the world watching, creates an environment where the limits of human performance are pushed away. Since the advent of electronic timing, there have been 23 world records in the 100 meter dash, 23. Of these, three were subsequently disqualified for performance enhancing drug use, something that I will touch on briefly later in the presentation. Of those remaining 20 world records, four were actually ties of an existing world record rather than breaking through into a new human frontier. So in the last 50 years, we have 16 new frontiers in human performance where someone has run faster than any human being who ever lived. Of these 16 performances that you see charted out here, eight of them, half, were set in the Olympic year. It doesn't take a math whiz to realize that the Olympic year and the preparation that goes into it and the pressure of performing in that Olympic year brings out the absolute best in athletes. But we also need a little bit of luck. And what I want to say about luck is luck can be luck luck can run the gamut. For those of you in the audience who are cynics and pessimists and wondering where performance enhancing drug use comes into this discussion, this is where it fits right here. If you want to go your entire career without being busted for drug use, performance enhancing drug use, recent news suggests that you need more than a little bit of luck. You might be able to get away with it for a little while, but probably not your whole career. I'd also like to look at luck in a couple other ways. I once had someone tell me that luck is the convergence of opportunity and hard work. And this is how I like to think of it. And when we talk about opportunity in the 100 meters, we're talking about environmental factors. You see, where everything else is standardized, the track surface, the distance, the timing, and so forth, there are a few factors outside of our control. One of the areas that is not under our control, however, is environmental factors. And the two environmental factors that have the biggest impact on performance are altitude and wind. At higher altitudes, the air is thinner, athletes can sprint faster. A gust of wind can obviously push you to faster and faster performances. So let's focus on wind for a second here, something that is out of our control. In this chart, we're looking at the 676 sub-10 performances again, once again tiered by tenth of a second. And you're looking at them in relationship with the wind reading associated with those performances. Every high-level competition measures the wind at a race, and there are limits on how much wind is permissible for a world record performance. What we see here is quite interesting. Not only is every single wind reading, average wind reading, positive, 
but there is a direct correlation with the performance. So there's no, no tail or no headwinds here. They're all tailwinds, all tailwinds. If you didn't know any better, you might actually think that every single 100 meters straightaway in the whole world was directly aligned with the prevailing wind in that area, which is absolutely absurd. This is a classic case of people taking advantage of an opportunity. But let's look at this red line here. The red line, red bar, represents world record performances. So those 16 new frontiers in performance. Notice how the wind reading is markedly higher for than all of the other elite, but not world record performances. Clearly indicating that if you want to be better than anyone who has ever lived before, you better take advantage of those opportunities. You better take advantage of lucky situations that come upon you. But a little bit of luck and a gust of wind is, is not all it's gonna, it's gonna take a little bit more than that. We also need heroes, foils, and fellow boundary pushers. New thought thinking calls this the law of attraction. Like attracts like. I'll make you faster, you make me faster. Classic example of this is Sir Roger Bannister the first man to break four minutes in the mile. Prior to Bannister, the world record stood at 401 for nine years. Nine years. When Bannister broke that world record in 1954, the floodgates opened. Within 46 days, 46 days, someone had run faster than Bannister. And within two years, there were 10 athletes who had run as fast or faster than Bannister, clearly showing that it helps to have fellow boundary pushers. We're seeing a similar effect in the men's 100 meters today. The top 28 performances of all time, 28, were run by five men who are all competing against each other in the current era. The top 28 by five men. If you're that fifth place guy, how badly do you want a time machine? <laughs> now it's easy to think that if it weren't for those four guys in front of him, he'd be the greatest of all time in the world record holder. But the reality is that if it weren't for those four guys in front of him, he likely wouldn't be anywhere near where he is. Remember, like attracts like. You make me faster, I'll make you faster. On top of all these things, there's still one more piece to the puzzle, and that's belief. You see, if athletes don't believe a performance, if they can't conceive it themselves, it's not going to be possible to surpass it. In 1979, Pietro Menea set the world record in the 200 meters in near perfect conditions. He ran at altitude in Mexico City and the rarefied air allowed him to sprint faster than any sea level, sea level venue. He also had nearly the maximum allowable wind reading. Because of this, people viewed his world record as being an anomaly of performance, near perfect conditions, a perfect storm if you will. And for 17 years, no one could break it. Then in 1996, Michael Johnson at the U.S. Olympic trials, I'd like to point out, <laughs> broke his world record, broke Manea's world record. Then just five weeks later, he shattered it by 0.34 seconds. That is an era in sp oh, elite sprinting. And in the process, he brought another athlete under Manea's old world record, supporting both my idea about the importance of a big stage, it was at the Olympic Games, as well as put fellow, having fellow boundary pushers. In the 17 years that have passed since Michael Johnson set his record, eight athletes have run as fast or faster than Manea 29 times. For whatever reason, when Johnson ran that record, everyone that said impossible almost overnight seemed to say, I'm possible. So the next time you watch the Olympics, remember that these people are more than just sportsmen. They are boundary pushers, pursuers of a tangible excellence. And those that participate in widely, widely participated, objectively assessed activities are true frontiersmen that can show us what it takes to pursue excellence in a very tangible and clearly defined way. Being your best is one of the most rewarding parts of the human experience, something we all desire. And I think that we can learn something
from these performers who are operating at the margins of human capacity. We can avoid the sensationalist and polarizing views that all it takes is talent, or practicing a certain number of hours, or being at the right place at the right time. The reality is you need all of that and a lot more. What we can learn from these athletes who are choosing to participate in a sport where the margins between also ran forgotten athlete and absolute greatness are razor thin and clearly defined. Having worked with boundary pushers, I've learned several things. Pursue your talent. Find your talent and make it your passion. Nurture it in every way you can and leave nothing to chance. Find the biggest possible stage you can and make it yours. Take advantage of any opportunity that comes your way. Surround yourself with people who can make, push you to your limit and beyond and believe that impossible is just a word. Thank you.